There are some people these days who worry about social collapse, our social identities are, what our social relationships are, what our social differences are, that those changes are leading to some sort of breakdown of social order, some sort of breakdown of society as we have known it. I think that's a little bit panicky, but I do think there are four fundamental changes that do change this fundamental process of social differentiation and social fragmentation. That's what I'm talking about on the Birding Archive this week. I'm Jeff Rich. This is the Birding Archive where we try to see the world a little bit more clearly with some good quality world history and I am doing the second of my remastered episodes on social fragmentation, social polarization, social differentiation, social collapse, so many different terms for it, revolution, breakdown, who knows exactly what the best way to talk about it is. And in this episode from 2021, it's the second part of episode 11 of the Burning Archive podcast from 2021. I've uh, cut down and edited and remastered and I'm representing to you because it's terribly relevant to some issues today. Only this year, the historian Peter Turchin has published a book on his theory of elite competition leading to a social collapse to political disintegration. The book is called End Times and it is making, it's creating a bit of a buzz. There are a lot of people who talk up in these ways. There's a lot of decline and social collapse talk going on, especially with protests in Paris and prices going up and all the other things that I talked about last week. I hope you enjoy this episode. I really set out here the ideas of Emmanuel Todd um, about four big changes that have really transformed advanced complex societies over the last 50 to 100 years. Changes in life expectancy, changes in family systems changing, changes in education and changes in the levels of social or economic inequality. And uh, towards the end of the program, I actually also raise Peter Turchin's ideas about elite competition and I'll be addressing them more in next week's show. But here is my episode. I will be back at the end of the episode with a brief Uh, recap, brief message from our current times. I hope you enjoy this episode, this special remastered episode on social fragmentation and the four big changes that are changing our society. Okay, so the first uh, of these little trends is around age and longevity. And it's always kind of fun when you look at history and trying to realise some of the differences between your time and our time and how things change over time is to do a little trick of, you know, let's look back one year and then maybe five years and ten years, twenty, fifty, hundred, two fifty, a thousand years. What sort of things change and some of the fundamental measures of society around that? And you can get a really good sense of this with age, longevity and life expectancy. Funnily enough, the best place in the world to do it is Sweden for various reasons. I'm not entirely sure. I think they had a great scientific tradition and a very good administrative tradition. Sweden uh, was really the first society that had it excellent early vital records, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates. And as a result, people have been able to go back and calculate 
very accurately life expectancy statistics, average life expectancy at birth in Sweden, uh, and they're able to go all the way back to 1750, which is earlier than any other uh, society. And people can provide estimates, but in the case of Sweden, it's pretty reliable. So let's just do this sort of backward look at Sweden in terms of the average life expectancy and just get a sense of the dramatic, amazing change that has happened in people's social life over the last 250 years. It's projected that in 2050 in Sweden, the life expectancy at birth of a male will be 83 and of a female, 86. In 2000, the life expectancy of a man in Sweden was 77 and of a woman 82 in 1900 so 120 years ago now the life expectancy of a man was 51 and 54 for a woman and in 1750 the life expectancy at birth of a man was 35 and 38 for a woman now you may know life expectancy at birth and life is one measure uh, and life expectancy at 65 is another measure because life expectancy at birth is to some degree defined by the number of children who die young and that sort of thing people who die in their 20s all that sort of stuff Uh, so just because in 1750 life expectancy was 35 didn't mean no one lived beyond 35 it just meant on average that's kind of your chances of where you get to. If you are lucky enough to survive to 65 in 1750 in Sweden, you you probably had 10 years left. Whereas today, you have uh, 17 to 20 years left. So that's doubled over 250 years. So lifespan doesn't really lengthen. It's just that but it's more that fewer people sort of fall off the perch. And look, Obviously, this isn't just a Swedish phenomenon. You can look at the same thing in Australia. And life expectancy shows this broad linear increase, slow, gradual slope up, pretty continuous growth up since the mid 19th century. In 1890 in Australia, or in the the 1890s in Australia, the life expectancy at birth of a man was 51.1 and of a woman 54.8. In 1960, that had increased to 67.9 for a man and 74.2 extra 20 years of life in 70 years. And in 2019, in Australia, that had increased to 80.9 for a man and 85 for a woman. So compared to the 1890s, and for it's roughly 30 extra years. So in 120 years, life expectancy has increased by 30 years. So 30 over 50 is roughly, that's 60%, 60% more life. Wow, pretty amazing. And there are the same sort of stats again at 65, which show similar sort of basic, you know, sort of like a doubling of the years you can expect at the age of 65 to survive. So now it's pretty reasonable for people to expect to survive into their mid-80s, whereas in the 1890s, if you were lucky enough to get to 65, it would be pretty unlikely for you to get to 80. So this change has an enormous impact, not so much on an individual lifespan, although I guess it does have that. People can confidently approach life in a way, and, you know, the likelihood of death before 50 is now very low. So people can confidently approach life without worrying too much about external threats. But it also has a dramatic impact on social structure and your experience of social relationships. And this is most clear if you look at population age pyramids. So a little sort of bar sort of stack bar chart that shows the proportion the yeah the proportions of people at zero to five zero to five to ten etc all the way up to the 80s by uh, gender and back before 
even before 1960, it was basically like a, a straight pyramid. Two sloping lines that come together. Looks like a triangle. At each age group, uh, as people get, there are fewer people at older ages all the way up the scale. And so within society, there are just a hell of a lot more children relative to grandparents and older people of all kinds. Whereas in today's society, it's pretty much it's like, how would you describe it? It's, it's pretty much like a goes straight up all the way. It's two vertical lines that go up. And then towards the end, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, they rapidly come together. So there's pretty much roughly similar proportions of people at all ages. And obviously there are a lot more age brackets in adulthood. I guess if you look at five-year age brackets, there are only three or four age brackets that relate to children. 15 age brackets that relate to, to adults. So... Within the society, there's just a much more visible presence of older people and adults and fewer children around you. There's less likelihood of of grief in early early life as a child, less likelihood of losing your parents, less likelihood of losing your grandparents as a child. So this change isn't just about paying for pensions and superannuation, it actually changes the, the, the fundamental change in ageing life expectancy and the population structure as a result changes a whole series of things about how we experience social life, how we experience the prospect of death, the likely risks of death, the generational cohesiveness or cross-generational connections that people have. It, and it can change, I guess, the pattern of finding meaning over life. We can reliably expect to go through many, many different phases of life. We can reliably expect to enjoy 20, 30 years after retiring and have a wonderful different phase of living. And this is just not really something that existed for people even 50 years ago even 40 years ago. This is something that has really happened even within my own sort of lifetime. Second big social change remarked upon by Emmanuel Todd and that is sort of driving social change, social differentiation, is family systems. Now, at one level, as Todd says, this is about the collapse of fertility rates between 1960 and 1980. And, of course, there's a huge growth in education for women and also the readily available contraception from 1960 with the pill and all that sort of thing and and also changes in religious practices and all that sort of thing, which all contribute to these fertility rates. But they're dramatic So and they happen across the world. So in 1960 in Australia, 3.45, so nearly three and a half children born per uh, woman or per family and in 2019 that's down to 1.6 so less than half in china it's from 5.76 to 1.7 so that's about almost a quarter of uh, that level in russia it's fallen from a much lower level 2.52 to 1.5 in england 2.71 to 1.63 and the united states 3.65 to 1.71 so roughly similar to australia similarly there have been uh, you know, a steady rise in the age of mother at first child from, I think, sort of like mid-late 20s through to early early 30s, and that bumps up against a, I guess, a biological limit, which to some degree people, you know, fertility, actual biological, the whatever the right word for it, the biological potential of fertility is uh, just declines dramatically. Um from the early 30s and accelerates after the mid-30s and social change unfortunately can't really address that but there's certainly been a dramatic increase in the use of IVF 
And then that also creates possibilities for non-traditional families to have have children and all the rest of it. So this cre- again creates a significant change in basic patterns and structures of of uh, family relationships. It makes incredibly more diverse, plural set of family systems and enormous blessings. For Uh, with that, but also growing diversity of experiences. Now, what Emmanuel Todd focuses on is not so much that fertility rate as the different family systems in different countries, uh, cultures, and how they have uh, changed over time. And if I just quickly run through his typology of uh, six family systems gives a sense of what he's really saying here and he i mean he's a demographer he's a specialist in family systems so he 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 is going to focus on this but there's the pure nuclear family which is a couple and children uh, and that's common in australia and the uk the us new zealand england canada parts of italy spain and portugal it's what we typically know i guess in our own uh, my own culture and then there's the nuclear family with temporary co-residence where an adult married child lives with the parents of one or other spouse. And this is common in Philippines, Belgium, the Eurasian steppe, parts of Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, southern, it- uh, southern India and large parts of Southeast Asia and, and uh, in Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, parts of Indonesia, it's also you know, we will typically go and live with the the mother's parents when when children are young, or when a new family is being formed. And then there's what he calls the stem family, where there's a single, typically male heir within the family who cohabits with the parents together with their children, and so form a three generation family. And this is common in Japan, Germany, Korea, South West France, Sweden, and parts of Spain, Borneo, and Portugal. And you see it in like cross generational solutions for looking after old people are much more common in some of those um, some of those societies. Then you have what he describes as the exogamous, so marrying outside of the family communitarian family where brothers are the same and there's male superiority if you like if you think about a large peasant household but this is quite common in china russia amongst the hopi indians in america and in northern india and then there's the endogamous as in marry within the family marry cousins or whatever communitarian family where they're fathers and sons with closely related marriages i.e cousins who live together you know, in a large unit. Uh, and this is very common, I guess, in the Muslim world, in the Arab states, in Iran, Egypt, and Pakistan. So incredibly complicated how diverse family systems are. And when you think about it with increasing migration around the world, certainly in Australia common, uh, you wonder how much some of these uh, different family systems start to blend and mingle within the same society. And that's all it's just it's again it's just a social fact but you wonder what how that uh, generates differences and uh, tensions within social life as well as well as I guess ways of new, new possibilities within it as well now Emmanuel Todd argues that that uh, that there is a version of history that describes the modern nuclear family as a relatively new invention that came with the industrial west and so it's a new invention that, that replaced, if you like, things like the STEM family or those communitarian families in other societies. In fact, Todd argues this is actually not correct, that the undifferentiated nuclear family is what he describes as the typical primordial pattern in, most, in, in less developed cultures and societies. It, it's the typical... You know, if he's writing the history of humanity from the Stone Age, it's that earlier pattern of, of small bands of uh, uh, human groups would form, and that it's actually more the communitarian families and the stem families 
that we see in Japan, Germany, Korea, China, Russia, uh, the, the Muslim world, which are the more complex social developments over time. But the Anglosphere is very much characterised by the predominance of the modern nuclear family within their societies. And so it is a it is the social pattern that formed that that Anglosphere. He says the technological and economic modernity of the West coincides with rather archaic family systems. So when the West urges the rest, some of these other societies I talked about, to have family systems and social relationships like this, including elevating the status of women or gay marriage or whatever, uh, he says it's actually a challenge to long-established complex developments of family systems in these uh, societies. It's calling on them to deconstruct systems that had taken thousands of years to develop. And then when we throw in all the other complexities that come in with with families of gender relationships, gender division of labour, all these sorts of things, sexuality, generational relationships, you get this extraordinary level of differentiation of people's different experiences of family systems within our societies, as well probably as some of these more traditional ones. And again, it's not either, it's not a it's not a negative judgment on that. It's just saying, oh, that's a social fact kind of thing. And how do people process and experience that that growing differentiation and complexity and in people's sort of basic ways of life, given how fundamental they are to it's like like Todd's question before, what how do people process this these basic questions of their existence when they live are richer, older and living in family systems that don't have necessarily a, a clear culture to process. And clearly they do. And there's all sorts of generations of things, but I guess my, the question is, does that drive more and more this process of there are, you know, lots and lots of microgroups in the society that will have fundamentally different ways of life and have more and more challenges talking across the different, different um, social boundaries. Okay, the third big theme of uh, change as one of those big, big signs of the times that uh, Emmanuel Todd talked about, along with mass enrichment and um, loss, you know, collapse in fertility, collapse of religion, was the massive growth in mass higher education. Now, if you quickly have a little look at and as I said before, he sort of views the cycle of education as going on a 500-year sort of cycle, let's say, where which he really sort of talks about the change post-printing, which I guess occurs both in China and slightly, I mean, in Europe, but also slightly earlier in China, mass uh, printing, which promotes broader literacy. And then in the 19th century especially, you start to get mass primary education schooling systems, which contributes to growth in literacy rates. A lot of those schools are also church-based schools. So by about 1900, back when we got an average age of about, average life expectancy of about 50, literacy rates have been raised in the United States, England, Australia to roughly 95%. In some of the more sort of agricultural sort of European societies like Italy and Spain, it's about 50. And as a contrast, like Russia, you know, 20 years before it goes into the uh, Bolshevik re- Revolution in which it, the Russian peasant and uh, Russian commune plays a huge role, literacy, literacy rates are about 20%. So that's education revolution 
one, or let's call it two, because if you like, first education revolution is the spread of reading and all that sort of stuff post mass printing. The third then educational revolution is mass secondary education, so high school. And that really grows in most of our societies we're talking about from about 1900 to 1950, 1960, 1960, 1970 maybe. So you get to set a point where more and more people complete 12 years of schooling or at least 10 years of schooling, I'd say, probably more than 10 years of schooling. Really, we only got to about our current completion rates on year 12 in Australia in I think probably the 80s or 90s, like um, that sort of time frame. So big educational revolution there. And this also is really occurs in an interesting time because the period 1900 to 1950 is also the great period, I guess, of reversal of inequality, the sort of reversal from the, I guess, the aristocratic world of the 19th century to a much more democratic world, uh, the introduction of things like income tax and and the loss, the, the breakdown of colonial empires and the breakdown of aristocratic social status type uh, privileges. So paradoxically, the 20th century up to about 1970 actually sees a decline in inequality. And clearly, mass secondary education goes along with that and promotes enormous opportunity for people, fundamentally changes uh, their experience of life. And then there's the third big wave of educational or the fourth let's call it the fourth which is because i'm forgetting about printing and stuff the fourth wave is the growth of mass higher education so again just a few stats here so in 1900 and i think these are stats from america about three percent of men and two percent of women had a university degree by the age of 25 like hardly anyone in 1940 that had increased to about 7.5 percent of men and five percent of women by 1975 that had increased to 27 percent of men and 22.5 percent of women by the 2000s it had got to 30 percent over 30 percent so effectively multiplication of uh, a factor by it's 10 times over the century the the proportion of people with a higher education has been multiplied by 10 over a, a century, uh, probably by about, well, by about 15 for women, even maybe 20 for women. And by 2019, we've got to the point where over 50% of Australians aged 25 to 34 have a university degree. Yeah, by comp- and you can see the lag, so like about 34% of 55 to 64-year-olds, my age group, have a university degree. So between the generation of me and the generation of my children, it's moved from a third of the people within my peer group, let's say, my or my generational group have a university degree, to over half of my uh, children's group have a university degree. And again, uh, my university education is one of the great blessings of my life. It's one of the reasons I am <laughs> doing this podcast. So I certainly don't begrudge that. And in my own working experience, I remember working with the people who helped introduce the Higher Education Contribution Scheme, or HECS, which was really the funding mechanism that enabled the mass expansion of universities so that much larger proportion of people could attend university. So it's undoubtedly a positive social progress thing. But I guess what Emmanuel Todd has to say about it is that there is that shadow of social progress, which is that with more and more people doing the the degree, that education becomes that there's stratification, I guess, within that, you know, some degrees are more equal than others, and there's diminishing, perhaps, benefits of some of the degrees. It's not like it, people are having a different experience to, say, that period 1900 to 1970, 
where more and more people are getting a fundamental education and it's in a more prosperous society with diminishing inequality. What's happening in the period 1970 to now is that inequality within the society is actually increasing, dramatically so, as in wealth and income inequality is is increasing and education is becoming more of a basis for social stratification and also a basis of a cause, he says, of ideological cleavage. So combined with a range of other social forces, I guess, you get the distinction between, let's say, hipsters and bogans, um, between the Harvard elite or the, the Ivy League elite in America and the deplorables. You get the, the hipster-proof fence and the quinoa curtain. And uh, this has been shown by Todd, but also, I think quite recently, by Thomas Piketty, who became famous for writing a big book on uh, inequality of wealth and income, showed more and more that education is becoming the critical or a critical factor that determines or or is a marker, let's say, of education of of political belief and ideological cleavage. Um, the the people who might support Macron in France are different educationally to the people who would support uh, Marie Le Pen. Same deal in America with Trump and Hillary Clinton, is which was looked at by Emmanuel Todd. And I, look, I'm not sure if it quite works quite the same way in in Australia, but I think there is that element of the the difference between, I guess, that growing sense of the difference between Scott Morrison's quiet Australians and the the, the inner city elites. So I. I mean, I haven't seen the statistics around it, but I suspect there's similar, a similar kind of sense of ideological cleavage related to experiences of higher education. Todd argues that the other aspect of this mass growth of higher education is, sure, there's more people with a degree, but the actual quality of that education is also declined. And I think that's probably true. It's also started to stagnate. And then that helps drive a bit of a growing sense of them versus us within the within the educated group. So he says throughout the advanced world a new educational stratification has broken the unity of the body of citizens. A new inegalitarian subconscious has pulverized the ideologies and remnants of religion left over from the age of primary education. The crisis of democracy and the rise in populism are universal phenomenon. And he goes on, and this I find a very fascinating argument. I'm not sure it's 100% true, but I think it's a fascinating argument, which I'm going to move on to a little bit uh, next week uh, in the podcast. So he says, advanced societies must therefore live in a state of tension. Universal primary education indefatigably nourishes the possibility of democracy. Higher education, no less, tirelessly nourishes a higher class, which because it is selected by merit, thinks itself intellectually and morally superior in rights. This superiority... And let me just break there. And so that's we get the, the hipsters versus the bogans, the you know the denun- the denunciations by the political elite of the deplorables, all that sort of thing. This superiority is a collective illusion. The homogeneity and conformism engendered by the mechanism of selection, by which he means you know academic selection, produce the ultimate paradox of a world above by which he means oh, kind of we're a bit special, we're in this, this, this special bubble of uh, elite education, subject to intellectual introversion, but unsuited to inter- individual thought. 
and and he describes the um, the kind of elite, let's say, created by this social trend of mass higher education within a growingly unequal society with a stagnating educational performance and enormous competition for social status in a more fragmented society. He describes the elite that is developed out of that as idiotic and somewhat immoral. Uh, Pretty harsh judgment, I guess, but there you go. That is Emmanuel Todd's theory of things. And the fascinating thing, I guess, is he essentially proposed this combination of things, of the big transformation of society in ways that are deeply unsettling for people because they go to people's fundamental ways of life. The the threats to people's sense of what their family or systems and their 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 religious beliefs and their sort of I guess moral worlds like and the growing polarization of society partly driven by mass education that both fosters a sense of I guess superiority but then without because people get out of uni and find that you know it's hard to get a job and you know the education doesn't necessarily equip them for what they need to do and they maybe didn't get such a great education after all and um, but they still feel a bit special but a little bit disappointed it creates this sort of sense of tension and fragmentation into society this sort of sense of resentment i guess and and then also there's the whole the whole sort of in group out group sort of thing that he also also talks about in his book which i haven't really talked about there but that whole sense of in the absence of external enemies groups will cohere around an external enemy and then then they either turn to xenophobia like or they turn that same conflict into in groups out groups within their society hipsters versus bogans elite versus uh, deplorables. So that is, in conclusion, where we are with Emmanuel Todd. And let me just bring out again. So what we've been trying to get to here is some of these social roots of the trends of our time, the four big themes that have been discussed in the podcast. Again, not saying these social changes are good or bad, but just that they generate shifts in people's experience of life, their experience of social relationships, their experience of uh, meaning uh, and connection with other people, and perhaps also create a more fragmented, diverse society that has not quite yet found the counterbalancing uh, social glue that can stitch together this more fragmented society. Now, there are other things that Todd talks about too, particularly around inequality and religion, but I haven't really, and the sort of uh, xenophobia. He has this fascinating chapter where he describes Donald Trump's sort of victory in 2016 arising from these trends, which is described, the chapter is Donald Trump as will and representation, which is a, represent, is a reference to the early 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who wrote a book called Will and Representation, the idea of Arthur Schopenhauer and Donald Trump in the same uh, image is quite amusing. The picture I'm painting here is these, these, this tug of war between cohesion and fragmentation in the society, this tug of war between social fragmentation and social progress with every step forward there's this shadow that is coming along with us that is also changing its form. And it's especially education, uh, I guess, that we might be turning to next week because education aggravated by the combined effects of age, generation, family system, different ways of belonging, and then deepened by the growing inequality that has been happening uh, over the last, well, let's say from 1970 
inequality of income and wealth, driven in part by imperial rivalries, generate this social polarisation, this sense of elites versus the rest, of globalists versus populists, of somewheres versus anywheres, of hipsters versus bogans. What Emmanuel Todd says is, and it's partly this theme of social fragmentation as a sort of a dark side of globalisation that, that I'm getting to, I guess. So Emmanuel Todd says, globalisation can be analysed as a collapse of the notion of equality created by mass illiteracy in all advanced societies, but especially in the Anglosphere. So that's why I'm so interested in Todd, because he connects this sense of social fragmentation of fundamental changes in our ways of life generated by basic demographic trends, neither good nor bad, but just definite, and that demand all sorts of different political, cultural, social responses, and it helps tie together the various themes that I'm talking about. So next week, we have a little bit more of a look at this this theme of elites versus the rest, because I think this theme of social fragmentation is in part driven by education systems, but it's also clearly driven by unequal distributions of power and wealth in in the society. Uh, And it has been one of the big, I guess, talking points of the time of, you know, the elites versus the rest, that sort of thing. But also there's growing competition within the elite. So I think it's almost coming back to one of the issues I touched upon in the uh, po- one of the podcasts of political decay of different castes or castes within society of the merchants and the sages and the uh, warriors. There is a historian Peter Turchin who talks about major social crisis looming that is partly indicated by growing competition within elites. There's only so many powerful positions in our society, but more and more people who are educated and capable of uh, occupying them and increasing tension and conflict around that. So that's the theme I'm going to talk to about next week. And then the third episode after that is going to look at Uh, this whole concept of change itself and whether part of the social tensions in our time is how much do we as people embrace change? How much do we want to kind of stick with tradition uh, or just stick with continuity, I should say, rather than tradition, continuity in a way of life? Let me just try to sum up again. So I've been talking about social fragmentation and, and trying to sketch out a history of our times. And social fragmentation, I put down to this underlying sociological, let's call it, process of a tug of war between forming cohesive identities within groups and fragmenting those identities, driven in part by basic, basic processes, how families are structured, how the life cycle is structured, how old people are, what, you know, how many children there are relative to adults, that sort of thing. And all those things are changing in ways that we can't really know and is really controlling and neither good nor bad, but are sort of demanding uh, more diverse responses, which is a terrific thing. But with the diversity, there is this this or the differentiation, let's call it, because I don't necessarily want to get into debates about diversity or all that sort of thing, with the increasing differentiation and the the huge range of potential identities we have, the, that tug of war between cohesion and fragmentation sort of changes changes balance. So a bit of sociology, a bit of statistics, a bit of demography, a bit of anthropology today, as well as a bit of history. 
I will be back next week with my promised episode on elite competition and Peter Turchin and how it fits into this whole theme of uh, social polarization, social fragmentation, the common discussion. So that's been so common between the elites and the rest over the last, I don't know, 10 to 20 years. Is there a better way of talking about our directions in society? If you're interested in some of this uh, topic, do check out my Substack, J-E-F-F-R-I-C-H.substack.com, where you can sign up to a free weekly newsletter and you can support me by upgrading your subscription to a paid subscription, in which case you will get my regular essays on these big themes of the world crisis, including my group of essays on this topic on social crisis and social fragmentation. So do check that out. And while you're at it, hop into your favourite online book retailer and search Jeff Rich, 13 Ways of Looking at a Bureaucrat. That's 13, spelt out with letters, 13 Ways of Looking at a Bureaucrat, my latest book on my writing on governing. It's a good read. I've done a few things on the YouTube about it. Check it out and support me and my work and I will be back next week. 